of this draft. I have dreams of Malik Neighbors being there somehow for the Bears at nine. I assume you think that is just a dream and no chance at reality? Yeah, I, uh, unless something crazy happens, meaning that there are five quarterbacks that go early uh, and then somebody takes Marvin Harrison Jr. and then you get a tackle and then you get Dallas Turner going to Atlanta if they stay there at eight, then maybe maybe Neighbors is there. So is it highly likely? No. Is it a possibility? Sure. Would I bet on it? Absolutely not. Is there any argument that Booger McFarland would make that Malik Neighbors is better than Marvin Harrison Jr.? Yeah, I think it's a really simple argument. I, I think when you turn the tape on, he's faster. I think he's better after the catch. He can play inside. He can play outside. Uh, he's more explosive. I, and I think when you look at what the NFL has become, which is a, a league that is trying to get players in space, is there anyone more dynamic in this draft in space than Malik Neighbors? And I think he's way more dynamic than Marvin Harrison Jr. And don't get me wrong, because I, I don't want to make it sound like I'm saying Marvin Harrison Jr. is trash because he is a really good receiver. And I think at worst, he's the second receiver in this draft. It's just that when we've seen a, a, a league where Tyreek Hill has put fear in defensive coordinators' minds, I think Malik Neighbors is the closest thing to Tyreek Hill. Or better yet, I'll say this. I think he's Jamar Chase with a, with a little bit more speed. Okay, that's I what I wanted we, to ask we, you about. That, that's exactly right. what I wanted to how, how does he compare to Jamar Chase, another guy you know very well? You know, I think they, they both have the same build. Let's just think about what Chase did when he got in the league. Remember the game against Baltimore? He went for 200 yards, broke several tackles, went down the field. I think you're going to get that same thing from Malik Neighbors. Like, he's built like a running back down low. He's six foot, 200 pounds. He ran for between 4.25 and 4.35, depending on who you talk to at LSU Pro Day. So he got speed for days. And, guys, here's the thing I love. He was the last guy signed in his recruiting class coming out of high school. And he's always kept that chip on his shoulder. So not only do you have an uber-talented player, you have an uber-talented player that's competitive and has a chip on his shoulder. And to me, that's when you get the best uh, of both worlds. You get the, the talent, and you get the guy that's going to make everybody around him better because they're uber competitive. Well, that's an interesting profile piece to put in there from Booger McFarlane on Malik Neighbors. Um, this is a nuanced conversation about all three of these guys. Uh, guys, if you throw Roma Dunze in there, because they all seem to be really good. The, the thing that we've heard about Adunze and we've heard about Marvin that I haven't necessarily heard about Neighbors is the ability to get separation in a lot of different routes through like just his footwork and the precision of the route running itself. Um, I hear what you're saying about the explosiveness, but what do you think about that aspect of his wide receiver game? I don't know if, if Malik is as technically sound as, say, a Marvin Harrison Jr., probably nor should he. I mean, Marvin's dad uh, was the Hall of Famer I played with. So, like, from a technical standpoint, he's gotten the best of the best from a coaching standpoint uh, at home every day since he was born. And so I think... Marvin Harrison Jr. has something that if, if that's what you're looking for, you're looking for 6'3", you're looking for a guy that can go up and make the 50-50 catches, he can run all the routes, just may not be have that top-end speed. I just know this is a league that is, that, that is yawn, yawning for speed after speed after speed. Um, and, on, and on top of that, you know, when, when you look at Roma Dunze, you know, Adunze is just so smooth. Uh, he's the master of the 50-50 ball. He's a bigger guy. So I don't know if you can go wrong with these top three guys. It just depends on what you want. I like fast. Small and fast doesn't necessarily bother me because I was a six foot one, 295 pound defensive tackle. Some guys prefer six three and two ten. Some guys like their steak well done. Some like a medium rare. It just depends on what you want. Yeah, but well done is objectively incorrect. Well, well done is how I eat mine. And here's what I ask you: if 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 you eat your if you eat your steak. The same way you eat your hamburger, then I can agree with you. But it, but if you, if you eat your hamburger well done or medium well, and then you want your steak rare, then that doesn't make sense to me because it's the same piece of meat. Well, well hold on, <laughs> I, I, because I we get into this a lot of time with our friend Dave Wanstead, the, the defensive coach, and he's a well-done guy like you, but he's also a catch-up-on-top guy. Tell us you're not a catch-up human on a steak burger. No, ketchup doesn't belong on a steak. However, if you subscribe to the theory that I just said, that it's the same piece of meat, 
Yeah. Would you put ketchup on a hamburger? Absolutely. So I don't necessarily uh, – I'm, I'm not going to punish Coach Wanstead for that, <laughs> although I wouldn't do it. Okay. okay. That's good. Yeah, you're, you're a little more giving than we are uh, to that man. We'll, we'll note that. We'll put it in the, uh, put it in the holster there. <laughs> Um, let, let's talk about Brian Thomas Jr., the other wide receiver, because you've gotten us excited about Malik. But, you know, if, if, if the top three wide receivers are gone, I'm an advocate of trading down and I want to find another wide out a little bit later. Is Thomas Jr. a guy who wins 50 50 balls in your, by your eyes or not? I, he, he, I'm afraid he's one of those guys who's got the stature that makes you think he's a 50 50 ball winner but he's not necessarily that guy because it's more than just stature in terms of that skill. Yeah, he, he's competitive at the catch point. I mean, he didn't have to win a ton of 50-50 balls because, I mean, he ran 4-3 and 6-3 and 2-10, and so there was always separation there. I think if, if you want to paint a picture of what Brian Thomas Jr. is, think about what A.J. Green was when A.J. Green was at his prime. And, and I think if you have that – that picture, if you have that vision, I think you're going to get that when you see Brian Thomas Jr. A younger A.J. Green that, that is long, that can run all the routes. Uh, can he get deep? Absolutely. But don't just look at him as a deep threat. Well, if he's A.J. Green, I would, that, would, that would be excellent. I mean, that, we'd be talking about an all-time wide receiver class in, in, that, in that case. Do you think he's the fourth receiver? I personally think he's the fourth. He's the fourth receiver. Some may say I'm biased, and and, and I may agree. I, I think he's going to be in that group right there <laughs> okay. with uh, Adonai Mitchell, Xavier Worthy. Like if you like speed, and then it's going to be Xavier Worthy. Uh, if you're looking for a guy to go in the slot, then you're going with Lad McConkey, um, Ricky Pearsall, Xavier Leggett. Like I can go on and on. This is an extremely deep wide receiver class of guys that can go and make plays. I think they're going to be six of them to go in the first round. We talk about the top three. I think Xavier Worthy is going in the first round. I think Brian Thomas Jr. is going in the first round. I think Lab McConkey is going in the first round. Maybe Adnan Mitchell also. So you could get upwards of seven receivers in the first round. You get seven receivers. You get six tackles. That's 13. You get five quarterbacks. That's 18. So 18 of the 32 picks are already gone right now from an offensive standpoint, and we haven't even talked defensive linemen, corners, line, like we haven't even talked to any of the other positions. So the first round is going to be extremely offensive heavy, guys. Love how well-versed you are on the draft. It's an opportunity to ask you about Byron Murphy of Texas. Now, I know it's not it's not even your guy necessarily, but but a general question because you as a great defensive tackle in the, in a version of this scheme that we're watching Matt Eberflus coach up here, Byron Murphy's a little light. It's not a frame that you can add more weight to, I, I was reading, necessarily. They say his arms are a touch short, but he's lightning quick. So can a profile like that be a difference-making three technique? If the receivers are gone, should the Bears consider him at nine? First of all, if, if you call him light at 295, then you, you're going to call me skinny at 285, so I appreciate that. That's number one. <laughs> um it really bothers me when, 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 when people say, yeah, he's small. Okay, he's six foot one. he's 295 pounds. Last time I checked, Aaron Donald was six foot one, 285. Warren Sapp was six foot two, 290. John Randall was six foot one, 285. You follow me here? Grady Jarrett. Grady Jarrett is six feet tall, 285. So maybe, just maybe, if you're looking for that guy that can play the three technique, maybe you might ought to get a guy. That six foot one, six two, two eighty, two ninety. That can get vertical. That has quickness. That can get penetration in an offensive scheme. Because I don't see many guys like. And this is nothing against Chris Jones because I think Chris Jones is one of one. But very rarely does the six five, three hundred pound guy do what the six one, two ninety guy can do. And I just rattled off five or six guys that are pretty much the same size as Byron Murphy. And I think if you draft Byron Murphy, you will get similar production as far as a guy that can get vertical, a guy that can that, that can disrupt and penetrate. Because I think that's what that's what Flus wants, man. Like knowing that defense like the back of my hand, you got to have three or four dudes up front that can go get it. And I think Byron Murphy, whether you play him in nose or three technique, I think will fit in really well. So you know they're drafting Caleb, you know the rest of the roster, you know who the coach is and the schemes that they're trying to run. If Booger McFarland was Ryan Poles, who is your dream scenario for the ninth overall pick? 
dream scenario, I would probably get Caleb one. Um, and if Malik Neighbors were there at, at nine, I, I think that would be the dream scenario. If, if 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 Neighbors is gone, if Neighbors is gone at nine, do you do you go with the best offensive tackle? That's probably scenario number two for me. Um, hmm. Because I think when you look at what they did with Wright last year, you got the young tackle on the left hand side. I think having three, t- maybe a, if you look at a guy like Troy Fatanu from Washington, he he's a tackle. Some people think he's going to play guard. I'm a firm believer. Get your best five guys on the field. So if you got Caleb at one, you got Fatano at nine. You put him in there at guard. If something happens to one of the tackles, he can kick out the tackle. And now you got a really strong offensive line. You got DJ Moore on the outside. You got Keenan Allen. You got this defense that played really well last year. You got Caleb Williams. And now I can start to envision a team that can that can make some noise. Now I would still need somebody. Opposite Montez Sweat, I, I, I need some more rush because the one thing about that defense is that defense at some point is going to be predicated on the four guys up front creating pressure. Because even though Flus has become more aggressive, he doesn't like to blitz a lot. So I need three, four, five guys that can get after the quarterback. Uh, so at some point you can address that in the, in the later rounds. Yes, it's good stuff. They don't have a second round pick, so if they wait till the third round and get an edge rusher who might have a flash, is that is is that enough? So th- that's why we're wondering about if it's Murphy or Dallas Turner at, at, at that nine pick. You get your Sap or your Simeon Rice. Well, I don't think Dallas Turner is going to be there. I think if Atlanta is picking right before Chicago, which they are, and if they stay there, uh, I mean, they are desperate for sacks like I'm desperate for a meal right now. Like, they want one bad. And so, therefore, I think Dallas Turner, who's the most explosive defensive player in the draft, I think he'll be gone. All right, last thing for you, Booger, then we'll let you go get that meal, whether it be a burger or a steak. Um I don't know how to judge these college quarterbacks when they've got superstar talent around them. C.J. Stroud did. C.J. Stroud is clearly great. Joe Burrow did. He's clearly great. Justin Fields did. It's been a mixed bag. We know it firsthand. Is Jaden Daniels great individually, or is he great because he was throwing to Thomas Jr. and Malik Neighbors? Well, if you watch LSU play last year, Jaden Daniels is not only great, he had to be great, and he had to be great a large majority of the time because our defense was really bad. Here's the best thing I can say about Jaden Daniels, guys. Um, I was in the studio for ESPN opening night his first game against Florida State in New Orleans. And I was sitting there with Dan Mullen. And I turned to Dan Mullen and I was like, man, I don't know, man. Like, I don't I don't know if I see it. And so I, I, I wasn't ready to give up, but I was like, yeah, I'm not really sold. To, for him to go from that point to the Heisman Trophy winner and make the improvement that he made and have the season that he did, that he did with the team that we had that wasn't really a, a, a good team overall – says a lot about the kid, about handling pressure, about handling adversity. Like, there were games where he knew he had to score every drive, and he did. And that just goes to show you how he could do it, whether they blitzed him, uh, whether they doubled neighbors, whatever they did, he made the plays. Fifty, What is it, 60 touchdowns, 50 touchdowns, 1,100 yards rushing. Like, it, it was some stupid stats, man. But he did it realizing that he had to do it every single time. And that's pressure. That's pressure at – at any school, but when you're in the SEC and you're at LSU and the expectation that that school has for him to come in there and do that, it kind of, it kind of showed me all I needed to know. And he made a believer out of me when the first game that I, I saw him play, I wasn't necessarily a believer. So, Anthony, uh, and we'll give you Anthony on the way out, um, has your admitted LSU bias allowed you to think that Daniels is better than Caleb at any point in this process? No, because I think that the reason I would lean toward Caleb – is because Caleb can do things at, 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 at his highest end of production. He does things to, that can make you think about Patrick Mahomes with some of the arm angles and, 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 and some of the playmaking ability. Like there was a game he handed the, the football to the running back. The running back was getting tackled. He took it from the running back and then made a play. Like that's, that's second, third level, like graduate level type stuff that nobody even thinks of, let alone does. And so Caleb is still number one for me. I think Jaden is too. 
Uh, it wouldn't surprise me when it's all said and done if Drake May gets the proper coaching. He's the best quarterback in this draft yeah. because he's built like Josh Allen. He's got those kind of tools. Michael Penix is the most accurate quarterback in the draft. He's just got the injury history. I'll tell you the guy I'm not sold on. Like, everybody's trying to sell me on J.J. McCarthy. Like, I just don't see it. But J.J. McCarthy's probably going to go in the top five, and I'm going to sit there, and I'm going to be on the desk next to Mel Kiper and Lewis Riddick, and my jaw is going to drop. Because <laughs> I was always told when you draft in the top five, you need to be able to get a Hall of Fame-type player. And there's no way you can convince me that J.J. McCarthy is a Hall of Fame-type player. Like, there's no way whatsoever. Booger, this was awesome, man. Thank you so much for the time and the candor and the stories. We really enjoyed it. Thank you, sir. Hey, man, really appreciate it again. My guy that built that little montage on the opening, hey, you you are forever in my debt. That was awesome, and that went a long way. That, that is a nice touch. As far as you two clowns, man, anytime, let me know. All right, appreciate <laughs> you. We'll take it. We've heard that before a hundred times. That's Booger McFarland.